Hello friends, welcome to the ATC Double Cut. Today I have a little bit of a soil testing extravaganza for you on this episode. I'm going to talk about three blog posts that are related to soil testing. And I know the springtime in the northern hemisphere is a popular time to do soil testing, soil nutrient analysis to find out what nutrients may need to be added during this year. So in this episode, I'm going to talk about three recent posts from the ATC website that consider the topic of soil testing. And the first one is a video that I made. This is a post that has a title, a behind the scenes look at soil testing. The subtitle is, I went on a tour of the soils lab at Brookside. Here's a video and some notes. Many of you, I'm sure, have already watched this video. And if you haven't, I encourage you to do so because it turns out that people liked it. I saw some comments saying this should be played in turf school to explain what happens with the soil sample. And I think that this video, which is available on YouTube, I'll put a direct link to it in the show notes. I'll also put a direct link to all of the blog posts that I talk about in this episode in the show notes. This video was made together with the soils lab manager, Liz Skinner at Brookside Labs in Ohio when I made a recent visit there. And she was so helpful. I described to her, she said, what kind of video do you want to make? because I'd asked if I could make a video that showed what happened as a sample makes it its way through the lab. And I said, do you think that we could do something where we start at the receiving dock, where the samples are dropped off, whether they're dropped off by a client or whether they're dropped off by a U.S. Postal Service truck or dropped off by a FedEx or UPS truck or whatever, could we start there and show what happens to the samples from the time they come off the truck to the time where the nutrients get measured in the extracts? Because there's a lot of steps that happen. And this video in, how long was it? 22 minutes. In 22 minutes, we show how the samples make their way through the lab and demonstrate many of the processes. For me, this is fascinating because this is something that I do for a business. It's a topic that I uh, studied extensively when I was in graduate school. I studied about soil nutrient analysis. And I think as, a, as someone who might purchase soil tests or get soil tests done on an annual basis, as many professional turf grass managers will do, I think it's important to understand what actually happens to a sample at the lab because that will allow you to better interpret the results and it will allow you to make sure that you're collecting samples in just the right way. So that's why I made this video and I'll play a clip of it here to start off. From the time a sample arrives at the laboratory and goes through all the steps to get tested for things like pH, soil potassium, soil organic matter, and so on. I am joined today by Liz Skinner, the so Soils Lab Manager. The so Soils Lab Manager, she's going to give us a tour. All right, let's head inside. Let's go. So Liz and I went through the lab. We started there. They come out here on the conveyor belt. Technicians from the appropriate labs will come out and collect the samples. These are soil samples. So we'll place them on our cart and head into the unpacking room. So we, we started off right there with some example samples and we went through and showed the drying room. We showed the grinding room. We showed the sample preparation where the samples are uh, scooped and one scoop of soil goes for measuring soil organic matter. Another scoop goes for measuring extractable nutrients by Malik 3. Another sco scoop may go for a different type of phosphorus, a specific phosphorus extractant, such as the Olsen extractant, which is a sodium bicarbonate solution, or the Bray extractant, or various other types of tests that will get done on the sample. Perhaps there's being some... Uh, 
available nitrogen, ammonium or nitrate measured on the sample. That would be another scoop. So we showed all of that. We showed the really cool robots. I'm going to fast forward to the robot part um, because that is really cool. When you see the way that the, um, the organic matter gets measured, this is a two gram scoop. And that's a tiny amount of soil. When you're measuring soil organic matter, the sample has already been passed through a sieve to take out anything that's larger than a grain of sand. And then it gets placed in a small crucible, two grams of soil. And then it goes on to these robots that weigh the crucible and the soil. And you take the weight before burning, and then you place it overnight into an oven, a muffle furnace that heats up the sample to 360 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to burn off the soil organic matter. So now that soil organic matter doesn't weigh anything because it's been ashed, it's turned to ash. And then those crucibles with the soil go back onto the scale and they're measured by this robotic machine that measures very precisely to multiple decimal points, um, you know, milligrams or maybe decimal points after the milligram to measure precisely what the weight of these samples are. Let me see if I can bring up this clip. So it's measuring, it looks like it's got four scales there and it's measuring four samples at once. Yes, so the robot will pick up four crucibles, take them to the scale, collect a weight, pick the crucible back up, return it to its, its original position. These robots are and then pick so up the next cool. Four samples. And, you know, the, it's amazing at Brookside Labs, they can run up to 4,000 soil tests per day. And when you're doing 4,000 soil tests, I think it makes a lot of sense to have these type of robotic machines when possible to do this so the um there there's robots that do the ph and there's robots that do the soil organic matter weighing and there are also uh some auto samplers that are doing um for the icp machines that are actually measuring the phosphorus the potassium the calcium and magnesium after they've been e extracted from the soil there are auto samplers that um, suck up the solution and feed it through a tube into the ICP machine. So we went and looked at those two uh, after we looked at the robots. So I think this is an instrumentation room. Yeah, here we go. So what happens with these instruments, um, the auto, sample, auto sampler will head into the designated sample. It'll pull up the allotted amount and inject it into the ICT. It'll come through the spread valve up into the tip where it turns, it's like a nebulizer. It turns it into a mist and pulls it up through the elbow and into the torch. So the, that's the ICP machine, and the ICP machine stands for Inductively Coupled Plasma Spectrometry, and that is something that heats up the solution and all of the atoms to a very high temperature, and it's, it's something similar to the temperature of the surface of the sun, and when atoms get uh, heated to that temperature, they each have a unique color signature, and the sensor on that machine is somehow able to tell, based on the color signature, uh, it, it's able to tell what the concentration is of those elements because it's compared to a standard solution or a calibration solution where there are known concentrations of those elements in the solution. So it's, it's very high tech, and it is something that it, it is something that I think it's interesting to know, and that video takes 20 minutes to watch or so, so please have a look at that. If you're at all interested in this, make sure you know what happens at the soil testing lab. I put a few notes in this that I wanted to highlight, and I'm going to mention these here in case you haven't seen this post yet. I, I put point, For point number one, I said samples are dried at the lab prior to grinding. Because basically, you work on soil, uh, you work on soil samples at the lab. You work on dry samples, 
And I think it makes sense to dry the samples yourself immediately after taking them out from the soil. You can do that by placing them on a table, on a piece of paper, or in a box and running some air across it. Or if you're in a low humidity area, you may not even have to blow some air across it with a fan or something like that. But put it somewhere where there's a little bit of air movement. And if it's a sandy soil, that's going to be dry in two or three days. If it is a loam soil, it will be dry in slightly longer than a sand soil. But the benefit of that, in addition to removing the mass of the water that evaporates and reducing your shipping cost for sending those samples to the lab, the benefit of that is when soils are dry, they are effectively frozen and there will be no soil microbial activity and there will be no ion exchange. When soils are in a field wet condition, ion exchange continues. So you could have calcium exchanging for sodium on the exchange sites. You could have uh, soil organic matter being broken down by microbes. You would have nitrogen mineralization occurring. You will have all kinds of chemical and biological reactions continue to happen even though the sample is no longer in the soil, the, the, the sample has been removed from the soil and now it goes into a sample bag, as long as there's water there, chemical and biological reactions continue. Now the sample may take two days to go to the lab in a field wet condition, which, which you can do if you're going to get the sample to the lab very quickly. But a lot of samples, they may sit for a couple of days before you can get them shipped and then it may uh, it may get shipped and not get delivered to the lab for four days especially if a weekend intervenes so y there may be a time period of five to seven days between the time the sample was collected from the soil and the time that the sample makes its way to the laboratory and there's a lot of chemical and biological reactions that will be happening until the soil gets dried. The first thing that happens at the lab when the samples arrive is they organize the samples, make sure that the, uh, all the samples are identified on the form that the client has provided, and then those samples are set to dry in the drying room. And there's big fans. I, I'll go back in the video and, uh, and you'll be able to hear it. It's, it sounds quite loud because there's a lot of fans blowing in there. So we'll go into the drying room. You can see these fans in the video. You can hear them also. You can hear the fans moving the air around to dry these samples out. So that's the very first thing that happens when samples are sent to the laboratory. of the work starts. I just think that it makes sense um, to make sure that your samples are in as close to the condition that they were when they're removed from the soil. Because what we, what we care about is what they're like in the soil. We don't really care about what's happened from the time that they're removed from the soil and what happens in that week or, or so before the sample gets to, to the laboratory. And if you're sending samples internationally, which many of my clients are, then we're especially concerned with the shipping cost. The shipping cost sometimes is higher than the lab cost if we're not running very many samples. So the, the, the shipping cost is substantial. So we want to minimize shipping any water to the lab. And number two, you often when there's the samples cross borders it could be an even longer shipping time i've had some samples from canada that i would think going from canada to brookside labs in ohio i would expect that to just take a week or so but sometimes i've seen those samples take two weeks or or maybe even a little bit longer than two weeks and you can't control what the temperatures are so th those Samples, if they are in a field wet condition, if they haven't been dried before you ship them, and then they're in a hot truck driving down the highway, or if you know if they're, they're not stored in an air conditioned refrigerated vehicle all the way to the lab. So if you have high temperatures and soil moisture, 
you have biological and chemical reactions that can happen at a very high rate. So uh, is this a major issue that's introducing a huge amount of error into your samples that makes them useless? No. No, it's not. But when you get samples, or I'm sorry, when you get test results that come back from the laboratory, if there's any um, slight... Uh, if there's anything slightly unexpected, like maybe the soil pH jumped up by three zero point three des points, um, you know, it went. Let's say your average soil pH was seven point two when you tested last year, and then your soil pH has gone up to seven point five in the results this year, and you did not apply any liming materials. So you didn't really expect the pH to go up from 7.2 to 7.5. If, if the samples were dried before shipping both years, then at least we can eliminate, we, we can say, okay, it wasn't some kind of weird reaction that happened when the sample was shipped and, and it was and something happened during shipping. At least you know that it wasn't that because the sample was already dried. But sometimes when you get these kind of unexpected results um, with things, especially with soil nitrogen, the soil available nitrogen, the things uh, that are unexpected with pH or with soil organic matter, you can at least know that it wasn't something that happened during the transport process. You can eliminate that as being a cause of the unexpected results if you know that it was stored dry. And there are I, I put a link in here to the in this blog post, I think, um, or maybe in the video, I think, maybe in the video description. No, I don't see. I've I've done a blog post in the past. I will put a a link to that in the show notes. Um, there is a there is a blog post that. Uh, covers what ha can happen with the plant available nitrogen when the sample is not dried or not refrigerated. And, and what happens is you get a huge spike in nitrate that was actually, it's not real, it's an artifact of the sampling process if the samples are pulled from the soil and stored at air temperature and they're not dried. And that's what happens customarily when people send, send samples to the lab. So I think I'm kind of beating this one to death, but it is my recommended practice to please dry it. So you'll see in the you'll see in the video the samples get dried. I recommend you dry it and then let them dry it a little bit more at the lab and make sure that it's ready to go onto the grinding machine. The other thing that I thought was interesting to show, and I have some more videos of this that I would like to put together into some more explanatory videos about um, how the samples are passed through a screen. So uh, point number two, point number two in this video where I made some, some notes in the blog post about the video, I said that soil nutrient analyses the standard soil test for soil pH, for soil organic matter by mass loss on ignition, for malic 3 or one normal ammonium acetate extractable nutrients, these tests are all conducted on soil. Now that's obvious, but let's consider a little bit what soil is in the context of soil testing. It is... Soil, in this case, it means material that has passed through a two millimeter sieve. The largest sand particle size has a two millimeter diameter. Anything that is larger than a two millimeter diameter particle, that is no longer sand. It now becomes fine gravel. And when you have fine gravel, it's no longer considered soil. So for something to be tested as soil, it needs to be dried and crushed or ground and then passed through a two millimeter sieve. And that happens at the laboratory. There is a video that shows that. Um, I'm sorry, there's a section of this video that shows it. 
and I have some more videos and pictures where I want to explain this further because this has a lot of impact on soil organic matter test understanding because when you pass that sample through the two millimeter sieve it takes out all the gravel it takes out any undecomposed living and dead plant material it takes out roots it it takes out big chunks of thatch or anything that is larger than a grain of sand. But because thatch and mat and roots and stems and rhizomes have um, these fibers that keep them together, and so they they tend to be something that, that sticks together, they're not all broken up into little pieces that are smaller than a two millimeter sieve. Maybe this, it, um, maybe it's interesting to say what grinding is. The, the term is grinding, but it doesn't mean you pass a sample through a blender. It, it's not like putting a soil sample. The soil sample doesn't get put in something like a food processor or a blender that really grinds it into fine pieces. That's not what, what happens. The, the machine is more like a flail or a, there's also sometimes a crushing type of machine used. It's, it's not a food processor. It's not a blender. So you're not taking your thatch and blending it up into little fine pieces and then testing it. The grinding at the lab is more like a flail or a crusher. And the, um, the plant material stays intact in this it doesn't get broken up into little pieces it's just to break up dry soil and then it passes through a sieve so um maybe grinding which is the word that's commonly used could be confusing for people but what happens when you're preparing a soil sample for testing at a soils laboratory the big chunks of undecomposed living and dead plant material all of the thatch all of the roots it's organic, but it gets removed because that's not classified as soil. So that gets removed, and then you take a little scoop of soil organic. Uh, sorry, you take a little scoop of soil, just a two gram scoop, which is quite small, and that's what gets tested for soil organic matter. If you want to test for total organic material, in a recent ATC double cut, I talked with Brian Whitlark from the USGA about the distinction that I make between total organic material and soil organic matter. Total organic material is everything. You don't try to separate the soil from the thatch. You don't, you don't treat the sample at all. You just dry it to get the starting weight. You burn it to turn all of the organic material to ash and you weigh it again and you measure the mass loss on ignition from the time you have started with some organic material and then when you've burned off that organic material. So that's a completely different test. And when you do soil organic matter testing, which is what happens on a regular soil test, this video shows how that passes through a sieve. So I think it's it's useful to be reminded of that and to say, okay, if I'm going to adjust my sand top dressing or I'm going to adjust my core aerification or verticutting or look at whether this thatch reducing product is actually reducing my organic material, you need to make sure that you're doing the right type of test and you need to understand what you can and cannot learn from soil organic matter tests or from total organic material tests, which is what I call OM246. The total organic material, that's what you're testing with OM246. The soil organic matter, that's what you're testing with a regular soil test. And the soil organic matter, that's your humus. That's all your material that is smaller than a grain of sand. And that is something that you can use to predict nitrogen mineralization. And you can use that to predict some increased nutrient holding capacity that you get from that decomposed organic material, which now becomes soil organic matter. And another thing that I showed in this post, 
And I mentioned point number three, I said, did you notice the scoop sizes? And you will, when you watch this video, the scoop sizes might be smaller than you expected. It's a one gram scoop for the Malik 3 extraction at Brookside Labs, a two gram scoop for soil organic matter, a seven gram scoop for soil pH. And the reason why they do that for a seven gram scoop for soil pH is because they're going to add seven milliliters of deionized water to do what's customary in America to do a one to one uh, solution of dried soil mixed with deionized water. And that's the standard way in the United States to measure the soil pH. The reason why they need so much is just so the electrode can fit in there when they're measuring. And I showed a video of that also. The, uh, the robot that's used to measure pH, you need to make sure that the uh, electrode can fit down into the solution. And if you're doing a one-to-one -one solution with uh, a two, two grams of soil and two milliliters of water, that wouldn't, the electrodes are not small enough to actually fit into such a small amount of solution. So you, you use here a seven gram scoop for soil pH. So when, when you're taking a sample and you're collecting a soil sample, you might be collecting uh, 100 grams, 200 grams, 300 grams. One cup of material is about 240 uh, cubic centimeters, which would be something like uh, 300 grams, 350 grams of material. So if you're taking one cup of material, we're talking about, let's say, 300 times more material then actually get scooped for the Malik 3 extraction that's measuring your soil potassium or your soil phosphorus or some of your Malik 3 extractable micronutrients. When you're taking, even if you take a relatively small sample, and I often recommend for my clients who are shipping from overseas, I recommend to send the minimum sample size, which depending on the test is going to be somewhere between 50 to 100 cubic centimeters, which is about a quarter, let's, let's say one fourth of a cup up to a half a cup of material. When you're, test, when you're doing a scoop to test soil organic matter on that size of a sample, you're still talking about testing only anywhere from two to 4% of the sample that gets sent will get scooped and measured. So it's really important that what you send is a representative sample, and it's important that your sampling process is uh, done to the right depth and that you've treated your sample very carefully and you know exactly what you've sent. And then at the lab, there are a number of standardized procedures that get done. But you need to make sure that you've standardized your procedures too to make sure that you can compare the results year to year. So I have a soil testing newsletter for ATC soil testing clients where I send some of this type of advice and some of the latest research that I've done about this. And of course, I write about this on the ATC blog on a regular basis about some of the recommended methods that I suggest that you use to make sure that your soil tests are as accurate as possible. So that includes things like... Uh, drying the sample, which I talked about earlier, making sure that the results that you get are not affected by anything that, that might have been, uh, anything that might have happened during the shipping process. And the sampling process is important too. So I just encourage you to pay attention to it and have a look at that video and see how things at the lab are very standardized and then make sure that you know exactly what you're doing with the sampling process and the shipping process. I, uh, I'm going to look at another blog post now, which is also related to soil testing. So that was the long one. And it's kind of fun. If you haven't watched that video yet, I hope you will, because I think it is educational. It's one of the more, uh, more educational ones that I have done. And the next blog post was called, well, it has a title, Converting Between Soil Test Extraction Methods. This one is a common question, 
and I put a link to a reference document from Ohio State University. And the title of that document, which you can download from the link in the post, is Converting Between Malik 3, Bray P, and Ammonium Acetate Soil Test Values. One of the common questions that I get related to the MLSN nutrient guidelines is, can I use MLSN or how do I use MLSN if my soil test was done using a different extractant? And there are various ways that you can make conversions. And I've got a, a MLSN cheat sheet that I suppose I put a link to. Yes, I did. Um, I've So in the MLSN cheat sheet... I recommended some conversion factors to convert from ammonium acetate to expected results with Malik 3. So you can pretty much for any extractant in the world, I think you can convert it to ammonium acetate, which used to be the international standard, and it's still quite common all around the world. So you can find out what the potassium, calcium, magnesium would be approximately in ammonium acetate, and then you can convert that to what it would probably be in Malik 3. So it's not terribly difficult. You can make all of these conversions. And there's actually quite a bit of research about also converting phosphorus test results from one extractant to another. So I put a link in this post to some of the ways that you can do that. This document from Ohio State, if you're in with soils in the Indiana, Ohio, Western Pennsylvania region, I think, and, and you have ammonium acetate data, but you want to compare what it could be, what it might be with Malik 3, then I recommend having a look at that document. And also in this blog post, I put some links to uh, to the MLSN cheat sheet, which gives my guidance on this, which is basically the same numbers as what the OSU document says, because this stuff is pretty consistent uh, with the difference between the ammonium acetate and the Malik 3 extractant. So basically, it's a factor of 1.2. Uh, Malik 3 will extract about uh, 20% more than... Uh, it'll extract 20% more calcium and magnesium and potassium generally from most soils than ammonium acetate will. Malik 3 numbers tend to be a little bit higher for those nutrients. For phosphorus, you can look into that on an extractant by extractant basis. So that's one that is useful. Although I want to say something here that really what I would recommend is if you want to use MLSN, you can also just do Malik 3 tests. And that that is something that I recommend because if you're using something that's not Malik 3, but your soil could be tested with Malik 3, then I think, why not? Why why not just send the test and, and do it by Malik 3? It's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, there's one more post. One more post about soil testing. Ah, manganese. That's the one I want to talk about micronutrients. Uh, I told a story here about manganese, which is a micronutrient. It's an important micronutrient uh, that has some role in disease resistance. And uh, particularly, particularly for some root-borne diseases like Gomanomyces graminis, which is involved with take-all patch or with Bermuda grass decline, um, or maybe some may, they might call it take all root rot of warm season grasses. So it's Bermuda grass decline, but I think it's a, a root rot that can happen on different species of warm season grasses. That is a pathogen that can be suppressed. The damage can be suppressed if there is enough manganese available to the plant. But manganese availability is affected not only by how much manganese is in the soil, but also by what the soil pH is. And there's a, a availability index for manganese, which I abbreviate as MN, MN being the chemical abbreviation for manganese. It's MNAI. 
AI being availability index. This was developed in the 1980s. Who I, I downloaded the original paper. It was uh, Mascagni and Cox in 1985. I put a link to that original paper. They did this looking at manganese uh, deficiency symptoms in soybean. And it was there was research by Heckman et al. who applied this uh, manganese availability index concept looking at take-all patch in creeping bank grass. And the recommendation for turf grass, especially for creeping bank grass, is to keep your manganese availability index at 45 or above. And the manganese availability index is unitless. It's, it's not 45 parts per million. It's just 45. And you do this by taking your Malik 3 extractable manganese. So you, you take that number and you are adjusting it by what the soil pH is. The equation, which I put a link to the first footnote in this blog post, says the equation to calculate manganese availability of sorry let me start over the equation to calculate manganese availability index takes two variables soil ph and the manganese test result from a malik 3 soil test in parts per million and it returns a unitless result and the equation is 101.7 minus 15.2 times the ph and to that, you add 3.75 times the Malik 3 manganese in parts per million. And so that is going to give you a value that is either above 45 or less than 45. And it used to be that if the manganese availability index was just a little bit above 45, or if it was below 45, then I would say I'm going to use that result to trigger a manganese fertilizer recommendation and then I started looking at this and I don't remember exactly why but sometime last autumn I was doing some exploratory data analysis and I looked at a chart or I generated a chart looking at my soil test data and so I can just look at the horizontal x-axis at how much manganese was extracted by the Malik 3 soil test and that ranges from something like zero up to more than a thousand parts per million but most of the samples are at less than 200 parts per million most of the samples are going to be less than 100 parts per million actually but it could go up pretty high and then I looked I plotted that against the manganese availability index which also starts at around 0 and goes all the way up to more than 4000. Now remember 45 is the manganese availability index that we're looking for and I had been just showing only manganese availability index and I hadn't really been showing the manganese because I thought it was more useful to show the availability index that accounted for the soil pH of the sample. But I was surprised when I looked at this chart, when I looked at the relationship between the soil manganese and the manganese availability index, I was surprised at how much of a straight line it appeared to be. And I thought, whoa, accounting for pH, adjusting this for pH doesn't seem to change it very much. It looks like we just sort of have a fixed value of manganese avail availability index that varies not so much by what the soil pH is, but mostly just by how much manganese we've got in the soil. So maybe I can just show people manganese and that will be fine, and there won't be any confusion about what the manganese availability index actually is. So for a while, I've just been showing the manganese, but I was looking into this a little bit further, and I zoomed in just at the samples where the manganese availability index is less than 50. So when we get down to all of those that I typically would make a manganese fertilizer recommendation. 
all of those samples. When I do that, all of a sudden, it's not nearly so much of a line because I was um, a little bit misled by the scale of that. When I, when I looked at all of the data and saw that the soil manganese could be as high as a thousand parts per million and the manganese availability index could be as high as 4,000. Well, that stretches the data out over such a wide area that it makes it look there like they're all on a perfect line. But if you just zoom down in to something that is about 1%, like looking at the bottom 1% or 2% of the scale, when you zoom in on that, and that's what this next chart shows that I that I put in this blog post. This one all of a sudden shows that for a wide range of extractable ma manganese, which ranges from one parts per million all the way up in this case to about 19 parts per million, the samples could be above or they could be below that 45 level on the manganese availability index scale. So again, in the range of approximately no manganese on a Malik 3 soil test result up to about 20 parts per million, that's the level where you need to be concerned about what your soil pH is. But if your soil test manganese is above 20 parts per million, you're pretty much sure that there's going to be enough, even if you're at a relatively higher pH. So that was that was interesting, and I I made another chart that added some jitter to those points, um, which reduces overlapping, and then I I could see this a little bit clear more clearly what that relationship is, and it's something that I have decided when the next time I update the ATC soil test reporting software, the next time I update it. I'm going to do a better job of explaining the relationship between soil manganese and manganese availability index, and I'm going to show both of them. And I think, uh, so basically this is, this is something that I've found a way that I think I can improve because I, I had been thinking it was really great to just show the manganese availability index, and that's what I had done for many years. And then... For a while, I said, you know what? I know some people are a little bit confused by that. Let me just show the, the straight, plain test result from manganese, from, from the soil test result, because that's going to match what they see on the document from the lab. And, and basically, if we use a very simple pace turf developed adjustment, um, we we can know if there's enough and specifically what pace turf uh the the pace turf recommendation is that your minimum values of manganese that that you should be comfortable with uh so basically you want to be above these values if you have a soil ph of that's relatively low let's say a, a soil ph of 5.6 then you need to have your malic 3 manganese at eight parts per million or above. And as your soil pH increases, when you go up to a soil pH of eight, then you also have an increased requirement for Malik 3 manganese on a soil test result. Now it should be at 18 parts per million or above. So basically the pace turf range is in the range of eight parts per million manganese up to 18 parts per million manganese at a lower pH, you need to be 8 ppm or above. At the high range of the acceptable pH scale that for, for turf grass, then you should be at 18 ppm or above. And I thought, you know, that's just so simple, and it eliminates this extra number that people would need to think about, the manganese availability index. So for, so for a while, I was saying, let's just keep it simple and just use this type of range. But... Uh, now I think we actually can add some additional insight by showing both of them, by, sh by showing that relationship, because manganese is pretty important. And I have seen 
uh, I haven't calculated exactly how many of the samples that I test from sand-based root zones or from soil-based root zones that actually come in with a manganese availabil availability index. Man, that's a, that's a tough one to say. How may, what percentage come in less than 45 parts per million? I think it must be about uh, 10 or 20%. So it is something that I do occasionally make a recommendation for to add more manganese. But I've also noticed something that I would caution people against. I've seen, I've seen some people where they recognize that there is this link between manganese availability and turf grass root diseases. And I have seen some people, they habitually add manganese and then they add it again and they add it again. And in the soil, the levels keep going up and up and up and up. And I, I've had some soil testing clients that have soil manganese that is 40 or 50 times higher than the average amount that they would need. And uh, to me, when you start dealing with micronutrients, which are required by the plant in small amounts, and their amount in plant available form in the soil is usually relatively low, then when you're adding that and increasing it, to me, that's a very artificial situation. And I start to get worried about things that may, uh, may happen that would be detrimental to the health of the turf grass. And I can't predict what those are. And maybe you could have unlimited manganese and it might be great. But when you start getting 10 times higher than normal, 20 times higher than normal, 30 times higher than normal, I start to get a little bit concerned. Because certainly with copper, if you get too much copper, which is another micronutrient, if you put too much copper into the soil, you you could eventually kill the grass, but you'd also have some pretty weak turf and some yellow turf first. I think the same thing can happen with zinc. And I think you can get some pretty nasty damage on turf if you put too much boron also. So the, and uh, with iron, you could certainly burn the leaves. You could desiccate the leaves if you put enough iron sulfate on it. So there are some issues with too much micronutrients also. And I think one of the things that ATC can provide on our soil test reports, because we have such a nice database of, of test results from all over the world, I can show how a particular client samples how their test results are related to what's normal in that database. And I haven't done that so much for micronutrients because I generally try to avoid talking about micronutrients. And I usually am talking about macronutrients, things that really are important like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. I talk about those a lot. I don't talk about micronutrients so much, but I think um, if we've got the data and I can uh, I, and I can explain it better. I'm pretty excited about being able to do this for manganese and hopefully be able to explain this so that people can prevent any problems that happen from having too little or from having too much manganese or other micronutrients. I think when I update about manganese, I may update about some of the other micronutrients that are reported on a Malik 3 soil test report also. Well, that was an extravaganza, extravaganza about soil test uh, procedures and about some of the other things that happen at the laboratory that are related to the way that you may have collected the sample and the way that you can understand the results. And we also talked about the manganese and um, that is something that is quite, um, yeah, quite, quite interesting to me. So if you've listened this long, I'm going to throw up a, a, a QR code here on the screen. Also, if you don't yet get the ATC blog by email, because I'm talking about these after I've already, uh, written these posts, I've already published these posts and I have already, 
uh, had these emails sent out that have the full content of these blog posts. So if you want this information on the same day that it is posted, and before I talk about it here on the ATC Double Cut, and if you want to get more emails in your inbox, and I recognize not everybody does want to get more emails in their inbox, but if you want to get more emails from me and emails with Turfgrass information, there is a QR code that should take you directly to the subscribe page uh, where you can just enter your email address and then I'll get you signed up to get the ATC blog email, which goes out from 50 to 100 times a year, which is about how many times I update the ATC blog. So that is something that I will put a direct link to that particular, um, I'll put a direct link to that particular uh, subscribe page in the show notes. And you can also just, uh, if you're watching this on video, you can hold up your phone or your other QR code reader and you can get directed directly to that particular website if you aren't subscribed already. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I really enjoy having the opportunity to share this Turfgrass information with you. And I have some more interesting ATC Double Cut episodes coming up where I will share even more uh, discussion of some of the content that has been posted on the ATC website. For now, I'll sign off for ATC from Bangkok, Thailand. I am Michael Woods.